I don't normally do show of hands kind of stuff, but by show of hands, who in here has ever planted a garden or had a garden growing up? All right, don't be shy. Raise your hand. All right, if you've had a garden. All right, so today we're going to talk a lot about sowing. It's the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, if you want to flip there in your Bibles. But I remember when I was a child, we always had a garden, even though I lived in kind of a, a suburb it was a small, small piece of, of land that we tilled up, probably about the size of one of these rows of pews. But in it, we, we planted tomatoes and cucumbers and all the, the regular garden things. But as a child, I really loved corn, and I always wanted to grow corn. And my dad always told me, you can't grow corn. We don't have enough land to grow corn. It's not going to make enough. It's not worth it. Well, one year, I finally wore him down, and we planted corn. And I remember how excited I was that year to, to go in and, and plant all the corn seeds. And I sat there that night, the first night we planted, just sitting there waiting to watch it grow because I was so excited for it to, to come up. We had tilled the ground. We had prepared it. It was ready to go. Do you remember that excitement when you planted things, waiting for them to grow? The fun it was to, to know that those seeds might one day turn into a plant that you would even get to eat. Well, that anticipation... That hope for growth is kind of what we're getting at today. Jesus, in this passage, instructs his followers to sow the seed of the gospel and to leave the results to God. Friends, today I hope that we will be encouraged, that we will be strengthened, that we will be prompted to share the hope of the good news of the gospel with all who will listen not worrying about how they will receive it, but leaving the results of the growth to God. So would you pray with me one more time, and then we're going to read from God's Word. Lord, this is your Word, not ours. Your truth, and not ours. So Lord, as we spend time now in your Word, would you open our minds and our hearts? Lord, would you hide me behind your cross? Lord, that this message might be from you. We thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is the word of the Lord from Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. God's word says this, Afterwards he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed from evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. A large crowd was gathered, and the people were coming to Jesus from every town. And he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell along the path. It was trampled upon, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocks. When it grew up, it withered away, since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground, and when it grew up, it produced fruit a hundred times what had been sown. He said this, and he called out, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Then he said to his, then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? So he said, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you, but for you to know, but to the rest it is in parables, so that looking they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who, heard, who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they will not believe and be saved. The seed on the rocks are those, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in times of testing. As for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are those ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked out with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. But the seed that fell on good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by enduring produce fruit. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on the lampstand, so that those who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed, and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen. 
For whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. This is the word of the Lord. And we thank God for it. Jesus told his people to let their light shine, to sow the seed of the word. So let's dive into our text. The first aspect I want us to recognize is grace and gratitude. Grace and gratitude. Kind of in the background here, as Luke opens up this chapter, he tells us about the people who were with Jesus. Jesus was going from town to town, village to village, sharing the good news of the gospel. Remember back in chapter 4, this is what he said he was to do. He was to go out and proclaim the message of the kingdom of God, to proclaim that God was coming to do a new thing, that he's coming to save his people, that they should turn from their old ways of trying to save themselves and trust in God. And as he was doing this, he was going from place to place, preaching and healing. There were those who were with him. Remember, Jesus traveled with a posse. And we're told here that it's not only the 12, the disciples he had chosen back in chapter 5, but also other women who were with him. And these women were with him, and they were supporting him. Jesus was supported by these women who had received grace. Look at verse 2 and see what what it was. It said, also with him were some women who had been healed of spirits and sicknesses. And we get their names. It's Mary Magdalene and, and Joanna and Susanna. These women were following Jesus, but not just following him, not just hearing from him. They were also giving of themselves, giving of their possession, their money to support Jesus and his ministry. Now, I want you to just take a step back and realize how radical this was for this day. During this day, a woman's testimony was not even admissible in court. That is, if a woman gave a testimony in court, it was not considered valid evidence because women weren't trustworthy. But here, Jesus is teaching to women who the rabbis did not permit to sit at their feet and learn. Here Jesus is not only teaching women, not only talking with them, but Jesus' ministry is being supported by these women from their own possessions. Jesus' ministry was funded in some sense by these women who had received grace from him. They had been healed of, of evil spirits, of sicknesses. They had experienced the miraculous work of Jesus in their lives. And so out of gratitude for the grace they had received, they supported Jesus ministry as he traveled from town to town it was out of gratitude for the grace they had received that they gave of themselves for the work of the kingdom friends this is kind of the message we talked about last week remember the one who has been forgiven much loves much but the one who has been forgiven little loves little you and i have been forgiven of so much we have received so much grace from god we have experienced his salvation the forgiveness of sins so we too should follow the example of these women now we can't follow jesus around and support his ministry but we as those who have been saved by grace those who have received the holy spirit who have been forgiven of our sins who have been made sons and daughters of the king should give of our time efforts possessions and money to support the work of the kingdom of god We should follow the example of these women who had been healed of so great a sickness, who had received new life in Jesus and showed their gratitude for him by supporting the work of the kingdom. Now, all this is just kind of in the background, but I need you to understand that Jesus is going from place to place doing this. And so as he's going from place to place, as his disciples and these women are with him, he begins to teach and tell a story. Look at verse 4 as we see the sower and the seed proclaimed. Verse 4, it says, A large crowd was gathered, and the people were coming to Jesus from every town. And he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed his seed, some fell along the path, and it was trampled on, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other fell on the rocks, and when it grew up, it withered away, since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And still other seed fell on good ground, And when it grew up, it produced fruit a hundred times what is sown. And he called, and he said this, and he called out, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Jesus taught the people there, famously in parables, right? When we think about Jesus and his teaching, we often think about the parables of Jesus. And this is probably one of the most famous parables that Jesus taught. 
And a parable is simply this. Someone said the parable is a theological bombshell dropped in the midst of ignorance and disbelief. Let me put that another way. A parable is an everyday story that communicates theological truth. It's a recognized and understood situation that tells us about God and his kingdom. And here Jesus tells this story to the people to share with them about the kingdom of God. And this parable would have been a familiar situation for most people, right? You, you said, most of you, you've planted a garden. You have been a part of, of growing food. Well, at this time, it was very common for people to be a part of, of gardening and, and farming for their living. But it would have been different than what we do today. You see, they didn't plant in rows and perfectly tilled fields. What they did in this day was often they would go out and spread the seed across the field and then plow it under and allow it to grow up. It would have been more like what you do if you've ever planted grass seed where you want to broadcast it and get a, an even coat all over an area of ground. Growing up, we had a broadcaster. It was a green tub with a, with a spinning disc on the bottom, and you pushed it, and you would throw the seed out all over the yard to get it evenly covered. Well, this is kind of what they did. The, the sower would go out to sow his seed, right? You've got the picture of this guy. He's got a basket or a box full of, of seed, and he's taking it in his hand, and he is throwing it out across the field to try to cover all of his land so that everything will have seed in it so that it can grow up, and he can grow the grain that he needs to support himself and to sell to support his family. This was not a precision kind of thing, right? I like to watch videos about farmers who have these big giant tractors and all the technology they have to to plant in perfectly aligned rows so they can go back and and weed it and water it and that, that stuff really fascinates me but this was not that kind of precision this was much more a, a scattershot kind of uh, procedure he would throw the seed out and hope that that where it landed it would grow he was not concerned about where it landed so much that everything was covered but while this story may have been very clear to those who were around them. They understood it. They could get the visual. They have seen people going out to scatter seed. They've seen farmers out there tending to their land. The disciples still didn't quite understand what the theological significance behind it was. They understood the farmer. They got the imagery, but they didn't understand what Jesus was trying to communicate. So they went to him in verse 9. They said, what does this parable mean? They recognized that they needed help from Jesus to clarify what he was teaching. So Jesus responded to them in verse 10. He says this, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but to the rest it is in parables, so that looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Jesus said that the parables were there to fulfill in some part of what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 6 seeing or hearing they may not hear and seeing they may not understand jesus told his disciples that the parable was intentionally fuzzy but to them he had given the knowledge of the kingdom of god scholars refer to this as the messianic secret this idea that jesus he didn't reveal all of who he was to everyone all at one time you can think about the stories of when he healed someone. He told them, don't, don't go and tell anybody, but, but just go show yourself to the priest and get cleansed and go back and live amongst your family. And I'm not exactly sure why he did this. Scholars argue back and forth about why Jesus kept who he was a secret for some time. But we know this is what Jesus did, and we trust him. It may have been that Jesus was sharing this truth just with those who wanted to know him. That he would tell this truth to, to the vast crowds, and then those who came to him for explanation, he would share the truth. But those who were seeking to, to know him and hear from him, just to trip him up or to falsely accuse him, they, the truth could remain hidden. But Jesus shares with his disciples, those who sought him, who followed him, the truth of this parable. But before we dive into the explanation of this parable, I want to make just a point of application here. The disciples didn't understand what Jesus was teaching. So what did they do? They didn't go off and try to come up with harebrained schemes and try to put it together themselves. They didn't go off by themselves and, and try to think up what the explanation is and come up with the best thing. They didn't just, just dwell in doubt or cast it off because they didn't understand it. They went and asked Jesus. 
friends, when you and I don't understand what the Scriptures say, when we don't understand what God is saying to us, we should go and ask God. This is called the doctrine of illumination. It is the fact that God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who indwells us as believers, helps us as we understand the truth of Scripture. That we as Christians who have the gift of the Spirit can truly pray and ask God to reveal His truth to us and He will help us as we read and understand. To know what God's Word says, but more importantly, He will help us to apply His Word to our lives. That He will help us to live it out correctly as we come to understand Him. So if we don't know what God's Word says, let our first step be to pray and ask God to show His truth to us and trust that the Holy Spirit will indeed reveal the truth of the Scriptures to us in His time. Jesus tells the parable. The people, don't, His disciples don't understand it. They ask for explanation, so He gives it to them. Look with me in your Bible in verse 11. The sower and the seed explain. Jesus gives the disciples an explanation of the parable so that they will know both the story and the meaning behind the story so that it will inform their lives as they seek to do ministry alongside of Jesus. So look at verse 11. Jesus says that the meaning of this parable is the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Remember, this is what Jesus has said he is proclaiming. He is proclaiming the the word of God, the good news about the kingdom. It is simply this, the word of God is the message of Jesus, that he has come to fix what has been broken, that Jesus has come to fix our sin problem. The word of God is this, that God created a perfect world and humans in his image. He made us to be in relationship with him, to reflect his glory and his goodness to the rest of creation. But there was a problem. Humans sinned. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed God's direct orders. And and because of that sin, that rebellion, there was a separation there from God. The relationship that we were created for was no longer. Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's both physical death and spiritual death. Separation from a loving relationship with God. But God loved his people so much that he did not let this rebellion stop him. Instead, he sent Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, to live the life that we could not. He was perfect. He never sinned. He never fell short of God's plan. He died on a cross, taking the penalty for my sin and for your sin on himself, appeasing the wrath of God. And not only did he die, but he also rose again, showing that there is victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. The word of God, the seed that is sown is the message of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, my sins, your sins, that he was buried and that he arose on the third day and that he is in heaven interceding for us and that he invites us to know him and that one day he will come again and make all things new. The seed is the message of the gospel the good news about the kingdom of God. And then in verse 12, he tells us about how this message is received by those who hear it. He said, the sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, as the word of God goes forth, as we share the gospel, this is what might happen. In verse 12, he says, the seed that fell along the path are those who hear the word, then the devil comes and takes the word away from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved the seed that fell on the path are those who hear the word but through the temptations of satan they never truly believe it's taken away and they do not believe and are saved they are those who are carried off by the temptations of this world to not truly investigate and take root in the heart of the gospel in verse 13 he says that the the seed that fell among the rocks are those who hear the word and receive it with joy they sprout up quickly and they're excited about it but then when times of trial come along they wither away because they have no root they receive the word they shot up with joy they were excited but when the testing come when the faith really had to be put into action, when they had to decide whether 
Jesus was worth the temptations and the trials they were facing, they withered away. They had no root. Their faith was not grounded solid in Jesus Christ. Verse 14, we read that those seeds that fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear the word, but as they go on, they are choked out by the cares of this life, by riches and by the pleasures of this world. They produce no fruit. These are those who, who hear the word. They might even tangentially accept the word, but, but as they go along, it shows that their faith was not genuine because the cares of this world... The things of this life were more important than the truth of the gospel. They gave their attention not to following and enduring in God's word and in a relationship with him, but instead in pursuing the riches and pleasures and products of this life and not the things of God. They would rather have what this world has to offer than have the eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's been bad news up to this point, but then in verse 15 we read this. But the seed in the good ground... These are those who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by enduring produce fruit. These are those who hear the message of the gospel, whose hearts are soft, who are ready to repent of their sins and trust Jesus. And they hold on to Christ even when times of trial come. It says they endure and they produce much fruit. They are firmly rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. They heard the word and it blossomed and it held fast. Their faith was genuine. It was planted deep in the soil of God's truth. These are those with genuine faith. But while all this is fascinating, and we could probably extrapolate on this for days and come up with all kinds of applications, let me be abundantly clear about what this passage is not this parable is not given to us so that we can judge what kind of seed or soil our friends are and then choose who we can share the gospel with and who not to share the gospel with. This is not a litmus test for us to determine if our friends and neighbors are worthy of our efforts to share the gospel with them. Friends, faith is a gift of God. It is not a litmus test to determine whether or not someone is worthy of the news about Jesus. Instead, this passage is an encouragement to us. It is something that should drive us to be like the sower. To be like the one who scatters the seed, not caring where it falls, just wanting to make sure that it is covered. We are to be those who share the good news of Jesus Christ, who preach the gospel, who share the hope that we have in Jesus with our friends and our neighbors, not worrying about their reception, because that is not on us. God is the one who gives the growth. The sower did not care whether he got some on the path or some in the rocks or some in the thorns no he wanted to make sure it was fully covered we are to be like that sower who sows the seed of the gospel who shares the good news that jesus has died and rose again that we might have hope and life in his name this is a metaphor for faith that runs throughout the scriptures i think about this growth analogy right In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we read about this same kind of thought. Paul is dealing with an issue in Corinth, and in verse 6 of chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. I think that same kind of logic is true here. The sower is not called to, to, to determine what kind of soil is best to sow in. The sower is just called to share the word. We are called to be those who, like the farmer, make sure that everyone we know has heard the gospel. And this passage is also an instruction to us on how to pray. This passage instructs us that we should pray that as we go and share the good news of the gospel, as we live out the truths of Scripture, as we are faithful to God's command to make disciples, that the seed we sow would fall on good ground. That God would give us the opportunity to share the gospel with those who are prepared and ready. That's what we pray for the the Iranian Olympians. 
That's what we prayed for the people on Norco Street. That's what we should be praying for our friends and our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, that their hearts would be fertile ground, ready to hear and accept the gospel. But this passage also teaches us to pray that God would be the one who would prepare the soil. Because God is able to turn rocky soil, thorny soil, the path into good soil for His gospel to grow in. This parable is not an excuse for us to judge those who are not worthy of the gospel, but instead is an encouragement for us to share freely of the gift that we have received. But there is a harder truth, I think, in this passage that we must recognize and be honest with ourselves about. This passage gives us categories that we should expect to encounter as we share the gospel. This passage, Jesus himself gives us categories. He says that we should be ready for the fact that as we share the truth of the gospel, as we sow the seed, we're going to encounter people who just reject it. It seems as if they just it's carried off by the wind. He tells us to expect that there are some who, when we share the gospel, just won't get it. That they reject it. They are like those who the devil comes and snatches the word away and they don't believe or saved. He tells us to expect those who will, when they hear the gospel, get really excited and accept it and are on fire, but then when the trials of this life come, it shows that their faith was really put in something else. It was wrongly rooted. It gives us a category for those who we share the gospel with and they go along, but as the cares of this world, as the, the temptation to follow after riches and fame and comfort come, that they'd rather have those than have Jesus. This is not an excuse for us to say that those people aren't worthy of the gospel. It's not an excuse to say that we should stop sharing the gospel with them, but it does give us a category to know that these are responses we might encounter. So what are we called to do in response to this? Continue to sow the seed. Continue to do what God has told us. Continue to share the good news of the gospel, to to go forth in encouragement, knowing that God is the one who provides the growth. And we can pray that God would give us good soil for the seed we sow to land upon. We can pray that God would break up the rocky soil that is around us so that the truth might take root, that He would do away with the thorns, that the cares of this world might not lead people away, but that His gospel might grow. Jesus continues His thought, but He changes His metaphor. Look again at verse 16. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in might see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed, and nothing is hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen. For whoever has more, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Jesus continues the same thought, same pattern. There's no break in anything. It's just a different metaphor. He says to shine your light. Just as you were to sow the seed, you were also to shine your light. He gives them another analogy that they would have been familiar with, the lighting of a lamp. Remember, this is first century in the Middle East. There's no electricity. You're not turning on a switch to turn the lights on. You're going to have to light an oil lamp. And when you light that lamp, that small flame to illuminate your dark house, you're not going to take that lamp and put it under a basket or a jar. You're not going to bury it under your bed. We know this, right? We probably grew up singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. What? No, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. No, I'm going to let it shine. The point of this is no one does this. It doesn't make any sense. Just like the sower is not going to to be precise in his seed. He's going to throw it everywhere to make sure he gets full coverage. No one lighting a lamp hides it, but instead lets it shine. That's the same idea, right? If we know the truth of the gospel, if we have heard the word of Jesus, if we know the the message that gives life and forgiveness, then we ought to share it with all who will listen. To let our light shine, to sow the seed. Jesus in verse 17 tells us that nothing that is concealed won't be revealed and nothing that is hidden won't be brought to light. Think back just a couple of sections to this 
idea that, that some truths are not shown to everyone but to the disciples. Jesus is, in a sense, telling them that this message that I'm giving to you is not just for you. Nothing that has been hidden, nothing that's been disguised in parables will not be revealed to all, for in the end, all are to know and to hear about Jesus. That this message is worthy for all to receive and to know. So in verse 18, Jesus says, Take care how you listen. For the one who has, more will be given to him. But the one who does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. This is a difficult verse, but what it seems to imply is this. To the one who has the knowledge of God, the one who knows a little bit about the kingdom, the one who seeks after Jesus, listening to him with all their heart, to that one who has, more will be given. That as you seek after the Lord, after you you strive after His kingdom, when you seek to know Him, you will know more of Him. You will have more of Him. But to the one who doesn't have, the one who thinks he has, is what the verse says. Even what he thinks he has is going to be taken away. If you don't seek after Jesus, if you're not seeking Him, then you will not have. So what do we make of this text? What do we do with it? I think it's simple. Sow the seed and shine the light. Pray that God would give you an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus, life, death, burial, and resurrection with others. Pray that God would give you an opportunity to see seed planted in fertile ground that is ready to grow. Pray that God would give you opportunities to see people's lives changed because they have heard from the gospel. This morning, we're going to sing the song, Take My Life and Let It Be. And I want to invite you this morning to use this opportunity as a way to respond in prayer. That God would use you, your life, your opportunities, your job, your neighbors, the place where you work out, the place where you eat, the place where you shop. That those would be places and opportunities for you to share the hope of the gospel to spread the seed. Not worrying about how it will be responded to, but to let God respond to to let God provide the growth. To shine your light that all might see it so that as you share and live out the gospel, others might be prompted, encouraged, implored to cry out to Jesus for forgiveness. Also, as we sing, I invite you to use this opportunity as a time to prepare your heart for the Lord's table to repent of those sins which God might bring to mind. Maybe it's the sin of laziness and sharing the good news. Maybe it's the sin of, of judging people unworthy of the gospel and trying to determine the soil for yourself. Friends, let us respond to God with an attitude of prayer, asking of Him to make us vessels of His Word. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you for the grace that you have given us in your Son. And we thank you that even even in our sins you have died that we might live. And you have risen that we might have hope for this life and the life to come. Lord, forgive us for, for our laziness in sharing the gospel. Forgive me for my laziness in sharing the gospel. Lord, make me aware of the opportunities around me to share about your son's glorious death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, give us opportunities this week to sow the seed, to shine a light. Lord, give us boldness that when we see that opportunity, we take it. Give us boldness and security knowing that it's not our job to provide the growth, but yours. Lord, let us share clearly the message of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for everything you've given to us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. So we know you hear us. Amen.